It's a real delight to welcome Greg to our Chesterton Conference today. I especially appreciate the trouble he's gone to in flying up from Melbourne for such a short appearance given the demands on his time at the Australian as well as the looming overseas trip next week. When Chesterton wrote a book on his great friend, the Irish playwright and political critic George Bernard Shaw, he began by saying, it is indefensibly foolish to attempt to explain a man whose whole object through life has been to explain himself. <laughs> well, I feel somewhat like that in introducing Greg, even though his self-revelations, I think as a prominent journalist and commentator, do not mean that his whole object in life is to explain himself, not at all. But he's a well-known public figure, obviously, who can actually write for the public without talking down to them. He's a journalist and book author who has something to say, and he knows how to say it. In particular, I think he knows that journalism and publishing are about how a society communicates with itself. And uh, few know how this is done in our time as well as Greg Sheridan. <coughs> Among the many things I admire about him, reflecting on our long friendship, there are three in particular I'd like to single out. The first is that he has a deep sense of his spiritual and intellectual roots. He is, as he has said at times, a spiritual Irishman. Now this not only informs his worldview, which is described so well, I think, by the great uh, Irish political leader, Eamon de Valera, on one occasion to Churchill, that the situation is hopeless, but not serious. <laughs> <laughs> I think that captures the buoyancy of Greg's character and outlook, a nice balance of earthly realism and divine proportion. But his spiritually Irish character also extends to language and ideas. His love of words, of the clash of ideas in debate and controversy, and an exuberant sense of the ridiculous. Many of the ingredients I would have thought to contribute to an effective counterculture. The second quality of Greg's uh, is his great love of Chesterton, uh, whom he resembles in many ways as a journalist who can write on all manner of subjects, and as well as a notable author of books, um, as well as a speaker and TV commentator. Uh, part of his penitential preparation for heaven, I think, over the years has been appearing on ABC programs such as Q&A <laughs> and, and The Drum. <laughs> Many brownie points he can... Uh, no viewers say, here, Carl. He can say... <laughs> And the third, the third thing, a third thing I appreciate uh, is Greg's long-standing support of Campion College, which has been thoughtful and unstinting. I think he rightly takes pride in recruiting at least one student to Campion, Ashley Mills. Uh, Ashley read the chapter on Campion in God Is Good for You, uh, Greg's first book on Christianity. And as she told me, decided this was the place where she wanted to study. So there's nothing better than a journalist having clear documentary evidence that he's had an effect. <laughs> I also cherish the statement that Greg elicited from Sir Peter Cosgrove, another great friend of the college. If Cambia didn't exist, Cosgrove said, we would have to create it. <laughs> well, the mention of God is good for you highlights the fact that in recent years, Greg has become a significant popular writer on Christianity and in the two books that have been mentioned already that have come out, as well as numerous articles in The Australian and various public addresses as today. I think Greg has imparted a shock to our national culture by presenting a positive scorecard on Christianity. As an experienced foreign editor, he's entered an arena that is the most foreign of all at least to the most prominent elites in the culture, and that is religious faith, and specifically the Christian faith. As his chapters on St Paul and St Luke show, for example, he seems to have interviewed them. 
and renewed our understanding of their historical and spiritual testimony. And he's also interviewed present day Australian uh, leaders bringing to light the depths of their faith and the meaning that it's imparted to their private as well as public lives. Well, I think these elements, faith and flair, Chestertons and Sheridans, will be evident in Greg's paper today as he speaks on Chesterton is Good For You, Journalism and Books in the Counterculture. Please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming Greg. Ladies and gentlemen, thank, thanks very much, Carl. Um, uh, as Carl has always so generous, and uh, there's Virginia up the back. Hi, Virginia. And uh, Virginia is the secret to Carl's success. You know, it's said that behind every great man is a truly astonished woman. <laughs> and, uh, and Virginia and my beloved wife, JC, sometimes, not that we're great men, I'm the well, Carl is, but I, I mean, um, this is becoming a tangled image, but you know, uh, they, they have a lot of notes to compare. It's really wonderful to be with you today. I'm sorry that I'm making such a brief appearance. I, we had booked in to be at the whole Chesterton conference, but uh, I have to go to London on Tuesday afternoon, and. Um, I am so far behind in my preparations for this trip that I think I'll leave some of the preparations until after the trip is over. <laughs> <laughs> I often say that at the office, I, you know, we have to do all these insane online courses, the burden of which is don't take bribes and don't harass the cadets, and <laughs> mostly you've worked that out after 45 years in journalism. <laughs> I often say to the paper, look, I'll do, them, I'll do all those courses when I retire. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's great, it's really fabulous to be with you. Um, I was a bit of trouble with the plane this morning. Uh, they Qantas cancelled the flight, and I didn't know whether they did that out of hostility to me, <laughs> or out of hostility to Chesterton, or, or out of hostility to Carl. You know? but, uh, He's then, innocent. Then they booked me on another flight, and when I went to get my boarding pass, they said, oh, look, the flight is overbooked can't get on the flight. And I said, but look, Carl Schmuder will be very angry with you if you, this goes on. And so they found a seat for me. And I want to relate this bit of evangelization to you. I was sharing the plane with the Australian gymnastics team. And we have a lot in common, as you can imagine. <laughs> and uh, I could see all these super fit young people, all of them fabulously good looking and brilliant fantastic. And I said, what, what sport do you folks do? And they said, gymnastics. Um, we're coming to Sydney to participate in a series of competitions and part of our national tour. And so, oh, that's great. So there's a group of us all talking. And they said, what, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm going to Sydney. And they said, what for? I said, I'm speaking to the GK Chesterton Conference. And uh, they said, yes, OK. Um, that's interesting. What's that? And, uh, I explained all about Chesterton to them, and they thought that was fantastic, and they were so thrilled about it, and they wished they could come here instead of the gymnastics conference. <laughs> and I gave them all Carl and Virginia's private address, and they're planning to, they're planning to stay with you when they go to the, uh, to the Armadale leg of the tour. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm talking to you about, you know, building a books and writers and building a, a bit of a counterculture or answering our cultural moments, so to speak. So obviously we're, we're operating now in a, in a pretty hostile environment. Uh, we shouldn't overstate these things. We're not persecuted. Our environment is not hostile the way it is hostile to Christians in Pakistan or, um, or in Iraq or something. But nonetheless, it's a hostile, unfriendly, unsympathetic environment. And this, um, you know, I've written eight books. And I tell you, writing books is a lot like a heroin addiction. It's better if you don't start because you never really stop. You never really stop. And um, my last two books have been about Christianity, and the next book is going to... And in fact, the last two books are available over there, and after this session, um, uh, that very kind person from Dimmicks has just agreed to stay until after this session, for the 10 minutes after it finishes. But um, the, the next book is also going to be a Christian book, and it's based on this premise that... We live now in a time of neo-paganism, as the Jewish rabbi Jonathan Sachs, uh, the great chief rabbi, has argued. And, of course, the first Christians lived in a time of paganism. Very, very, very aggressive paganism. Corinth, in the time that Paul was there, 
uh, helping the first church, would make King's Cross or Soho or Manhattan or even Bangkok look absolutely tame. And, and yet the Christians had astonishing success in that pagan environment. They completely transformed the world. So the, the question this book seeks to interrogate is, is there anything from the first time Christians were in a pagan environment which is useful for Christians in a pagan environment today? Lots of things are different, of course, technology and everything. But the old gods of paganism have come back, the gods of sex and money and power and so forth. And, um, and all the old practices of paganism have come back. A lot of the old beliefs, you know, witchcraft, the earth, earth as, a, as a, a deity itself and so on, uh, all, all of that. But, um, but today, uh, we're not considering the question of paganism. We're thinking about how we respond to the culture in the light of Chesterton. Now, I mentioned once before at a Chesterton conference that Chesterton and George Orwell were the two journalists who inspired me to journalism. And they're very different, but they did have some things in common. Their attachment to the particular, that they're very journalistic writers. And, of course, they were the greatest writers. And... Um, Neither of them ever attended a university, uh, so that's a that's a paradox. Of course, they would have gone to Campion if it had been available <laughs> at the time. Mm -hmm. They were very much attached to the particular and to the concrete. Now, being attached to the concrete is not only a virtue of journalism; it's kind of an insight which permeates Christianity itself, because Christianity is an incarnational faith. It's not an abstract faith. It deals really with human beings and with with uh, with human culture. There are uh, much more abstract faiths. Buddhism, for example, um, a very honourable, fabulous creed, Buddhism. But Christianity is not like that. It always starts and lives in the concrete. And Orwell in particular argued, but I think this was also Chesterton's disposition, that you shouldn't think in abstract terms unless it's necessary. You start with the concrete, and then when you need, in classifying the concrete or dealing with the concrete, to move to an abstract concept, you do so then. But if you start with the abstract, you end up just talking meaningless rubbish. Um, I was also attracted very much to a quality of Chesterton's, which Orwell certainly didn't have, and that was Chesterton's cheerfulness. Um, Orwell was a tremendous misery guts. I mean, he was a fabulously <laughs> depressing person, whereas <laughs> Chesterton was terrifically uh, cheerful all the time. Now, there's a great lesson in this, because it seems to me that Christians who want to affect the culture in a hostile culture need a particular balance. They need to provide a quite serious, rigorous, searching critique of the culture that they're in, but they also need to provide a positive vision for, of the human condition and what human culture can be. Uh, in particular, if they think the culture is rotten, they can just create a new culture, which is, of course, what this magnificent institution, Campion, is doing. And I think it's what... Um, Chesterton and Orwell did to some extent through their books. Chesterton tried very hard through various institutions as well, you know, all the journals that he edited and founded and so forth. Um, but, of course, mostly they were, they were influential through their books. Now, in an infinitely more modest way, this is what I've tried to do with my books on Christianity, God is Good for You and Christians, The Urgent Case for Jesus in Our World. The publishers, because I've, I've published a lot of books with Alan Unwin, and they're very, very nice people at Alan Arman. <coughs> I don't think they agree with a single word that I write, but they are, the, they are the most unusual people. They are liberal liberals. Incredible. Hard to believe that such a species exists anymore, but they are actual liberals who are happy to uh, have people who disagree with them on, on things. Um, so the publishers agreed to God is Good For You really as an act of friendship to an, a, you know, an author who'd done five previous books with them and had a long relationship and so forth. And they printed uh, a, a modest print run of four and a half thousand, which they really thought they would never sell. And um, I think they thought it'll be really good if we sell a thousand and the rest can just moulder on our, on our uh, warehouse. They even said to me, this will be a book which will be on bookshelves for some time, they said. Uh, of course, booksellers <coughs> will reorder specialist booksellers. They might only be reordering one or two copies, but they will reorder, and it will have a, a longer shelf life than the average book. It might go for a year or 18 months, maybe even two years. And 
I thought they were probably right. In fact, I thought they might have been a bit over-optimistic. Uh, so I was very determined to sell the damn books. I shouldn't call them damn books, should I? Sell the books myself. And poor old Carl, I, I you know, recruited and exploited Carl at every stage of this book. Um, you know, I'd be I'm very attached to my one-hour constitutional every day, so I'd, I'd be working on the book and I'd work till 10 and then I'd go for my walk and I'd... Without thinking, I'd ring Carl and we'd furiously discuss some aspect of um, theology or church history or something. And then I'd say, oh, well, I've got a bit more work to do tonight, Carl. And he'd say, well, you know, it is 11 o'clock at night. And I'd think, gosh, I just rang this poor fellow at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But um, I pestered Carl to help me get lots and lots of speaking events so that I could sell through, and then I thought I'll secretly go around and buy a copy at each bookshop. <laughs> just so there's a minimal level of respectability. Uh, and of course, the two books have, have done astonishingly well, which is no credit to their author or their publisher. The publisher did a great job. But it's a credit to the gap in the market, that people really want to hear about these things. There are great Christian books every year, much better books than mine, but they are ghettoised by the popular culture. They're not allowed onto the stage. Um, just by being a journalist at The Australian and so on, I'm kind of already on the stage. It's a bit hard to kick me off and so on. And so the book's got that initial level of publicity. And God is good for you, as, as in all its incarnations, has sold well over 30,000. And Christians is getting up there. Well, that's not, let's be clear, that's not Harry Potter territory. But it's, it's um, <laughs> You know, it's much more than I ever expected or the publishers ever expected, and, and the books are, um, are still selling. Now, the, the, uh, the two books, um, God is Good For You, is first of all about belief in God, whereas Christians is mainly about belief in Christ and belief in the New Testament. Both books follow the same pattern. The first half argues the case, and the second half profiles people and movements who are living out the case. So as Carl said in the first book, Campion was profiled in the second half. Um, the, uh, I'm always happy in battle. I'm a very happy warrior. I, I'm absolutely relaxed about my enemies attacking me. In fact, I'd be terribly distressed if they didn't. Uh, <laughs> if they were a bit smarter, they'd just ignore me altogether, and that would be really distressing. But, but being constantly attacked by the left is great. Constantly attacked on Twitter, that's fantastic. I never look at Twitter or social media or anything, but it annoys my son sometimes. There are people who have so little to do in their lives that they, there are fake me's out there on Twitter, you know, who pretend Greg Sheridan. Some of them who like me, some of them who don't. Some of them who are very funny and parodying my views and so forth. I never really see it unless someone um, points it out to me. But with these books on Christianity, I tried not to be in that space, not to be... Uh, I didn't want them to be essays of cultural despair, which ageing white conservatives are very good at, and I didn't want it to be the books to be slugfests in which I deliver savage rhetorical karate cuts to my uh, to my ideological opponents. I wanted them, in fact, to be positive and cheerful and a bit more gentle than than that. Now, coming out as a public Christian was a bit fraught. I mean, after 40 years in journalism, you know, there's quite a lot to in the negative ledger, so to speak. Uh, when I started out talking about being a Catholic, uh, I used to say, well, you know, I'm not a very good Catholic. I'd say that normally in an interview. And I was talking to Archbishop Fisher once, and he said, well, why don't you just become a good Catholic? <laughs> I said, well, that's easy for you to say. You're an Archbishop. You, know? <laughs> you haven't been a journalist for 40 years, for goodness sake. So I certainly would never call myself a good Catholic. But I realised that what is an absolutely becoming modesty you don't want the church judged by your own life and you're aware of all the uh, you know, ways you fall short all the time. That can also be an excuse for cowardice. And if you, leave, if you leave the discussion entirely to the morally qualified, it's going to be a very small group of people engaging in the discussion. Perhaps only the people in this room. Perhaps not even all of them. Uh, you, you can't say for sure. So um, to come out as a full-scale believer was... was a certain psychological point, um, uh, I found that it was not really uh, daunting at all once you did it, you know, uh, and journalism is a wonderful profession. We are extremely judgmental of everyone else, but we're very tolerant of ourselves and, um, and of each other. 
And merely being a Christian and going to church and so on is by no means the weirdest activity that you find in any modern newsroom. <laughs> and uh, so I certainly got no negative uh, feedback from from my colleagues. Um, and uh, in fact, I'm, I'm surprised at how positive and friendly the reception was throughout the culture, really. Um, the uh, <clears throat> God is good for you, as I say, is about... So one of the challenges was to try to be positive. So God is good for you is, in essence, about belief in God. So I began by the idea of refuting the new atheists. So I read all the new atheists. That's a terrific penance. Uh, <laughs> they're unbelievably tedious and dull and obtuse and lame. It's the same old 19th century arguments against God, often put next to a whole lot of irrelevant science. You know, so Richard Dawkins says the universe is 14 billion years old. Well, obviously God wouldn't waste his time spending 14 billion years to create a little world for human beings. To which you think, well, Richard Dawkins, first of all, you claim there is no God. Second of all, how would you know what God would spend his time on? Has he told you? I mean, it strikes me as absolutely characteristic of God that he'd spent 14 billion years creating a beautiful garden for, for humanity. And um, I was initially going to write that key chapter as a refutation of the new atheists. But then I realised you don't believe in God because atheism is mistaken. Uh, nobody believes in God because atheism is not an established uh, truth. So I turned that chapter around and instead uh, made that a positive chapter about the reasons, the, the belief in God. I was particularly influenced by Roger Scruton's book, The Soul of the World, in which he argues that the most powerful rational argument for God is not, you know, um, Thomas's five proofs or anything, although, of course, they're wonderful. It's simply the long human experience of God, which the atheists won't allow in as evidence because they think it's subjective. But every court of law, of course, would, create, would rely on human testimony. And uh, the way that God is the intuitive explanation for everything, the explanation that makes sense. So that chapter went from being a culture wars, knock them down, drag them out, world championship wrestling, you know, I've got my foot on Dawkins' throat and here I've given an elbow into the Hitchens solar plexus and there I've poked an eye and sand down. <laughs> All that got ditched and instead it became a positive argument for the existence of God and with a little bit of stuff about the new atheists at the end. In Christians, the next book, the chapter I had the most fun writing was the chapter on popular culture, which I called Smuggling Christ into the Culture. At first, this chapter was going to be a celebration of all the cultural product that I like, which is 100 years old. Willa Cather, Chesterton himself, of course, Graham Greene, Evelyn War, a little bit less than 100 years. And I kept that, I kept a lot of that in the chapter because a lot of that is still in print and it's very accessible and modern folks should be made aware of it. But I realised a better way to talk to a contemporary audience is in fact to look at all the ways that Christ is present in the popular culture today. Uh, there are fantastic examples of, um, of Christian uh, presence in the, in the popular culture today, however unsympathetic the popular culture generally is. So a um, uh, friend, John Dixon, put me onto the, to the novels of Marilyn Robinson, and especially this novel, Gilead, which is the greatest Christian novel of the 21st century. Uh, I think by a very long distance. The great novels, the great Christian novels of the 19th century were Russian, you know, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. Of the 20th century, I think they were English, Graham Greene and Evelyn Waugh. And in the 21st century, I think Marilyn Robinson is without peer, especially Gilead, and then just behind that, Lila, and then just behind that, um, Home. And Jack, I think, falls away, the four novels in that, in that group. But uh, Gilead won the, no, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2005. So this is a culture completely unsympathetic to Christianity. This is a story set in 1956 about a 77-year-old Congregationalist minister, John Ames, coming to the end of his life and writing a long letter to his seven-year-old son, who he thinks he's probably not going to be around to see grow up. And the author is a Calvinist, and it's full of lengthy theological... Uh, contemplation of heaven and creation and yet it's an absolutely gripping novel and it, and it won the Pulitzer Prize which shows you can do it 
if you're good enough. Um, or take the series Jane the Virgin. Now, most of you wouldn't have seen Jane the Virgin. I got to see it in a very eccentric way. I was in one half of a hotel room doing my serious articles about the Chinese Communist Party. My wife was at the other end, and there was Jane the Virgin. She was watching it on, on uh, her laptop. And the dialogue was so interesting, I abandoned the Chinese Communist Party and went over <laughs> and watched this series. And Jane the Virgin, it's a modern kind of crazy American sitcom, and it goes a little balmy at the end. But it's all about this uh, Hispanic, uh, I think Ecuadorian origin woman, young woman Jane, growing up in Florida, who decides to remain a virgin until she's married. And uh, through a normal cockamamie, crazy uh, American sitcom device, she's artificially inseminated and so she's pregnant. Now you'd think this is a, a setup to mock religion, to mock virginity, all the rest of it. No, 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 no. Catholicism, virginity, everything, it's so positive. It's so positive because it's part of Hispanic culture. And there's a deep, deep into about, you know, series eight or something, Jane is feeling discouraged in her, in her faith and her atheist husband. She's saying, I'm, I don't know, I'm, maybe we're gonna take our son out of uh, Catholic school. And he says, no, no, Jane, your Catholicism is what makes you such a wonderful person. So I, I can't embrace your belief myself, but don't you ever abandon it. I nearly fell out of my chair every time I saw this thing on, and it was a big rating success uh, in America. Now, in the last series, they do a bit of, um, you know, gender ideology and so on, but it's an in incredibly positive treatment of Catholicism. There are Mark Wahlberg's movies, especially I'd recommend to you, if you've, none of you have seen it, Father Stu, uh, which he does with uh, Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson completely blitzes him off the screen. I mean, Gibson steals the show as the alcoholic dad. But uh, Mark Wahlberg is, is a, a, a ne'er-do-well boxer who uh, finds faith and is visited by a vision of uh, the Virgin Mary and embraces the priesthood. Now, can you imagine? I mean, this is... You can imagine this in the year of Bing Crosby and Gregory Peck, but can you imagine it today? But there it is. It's, it's there. And um, I should have included, but didn't in that chapter, the, that wonderful series, uh, The Chosen, which is a series about, um, about Christ and the first apostles. They couldn't get funding from it from the big studio, so they crowdfunded it, $10 million a series. And it's very good. It's probably not the best single TV series you've ever written. Watch, but it's extremely good. It's the treatment of Christ and the apostles, which is very, very good, very orthodox, very uh, human, lots of humour and so on. So that chapter tries to be very positive about how we can get into the popular culture if we're good enough. Now, um, I'll just offer you to finish a couple of reflections on what fun it's been to promote the books and what fabulous moments of grace have come about in their, in their promotion. Now, I'm a, I'm a Catholic, proud and grateful Catholic, pretty poor, but nonetheless, uh, you know, I've had three, three institutional loves in my life. I'm a typical Sydney boy from the western suburbs. I've had three institutions that I've been faithful to all my life. Canary Bankstown Bulldogs, <laughs> News Corporation, and the Catholic Church. And uh, <laughs> they've all had their challenges, but none of them has ever let me down. It is a bit of a test of faith being a Bulldog supporter just at the moment, but um, they're going to come good. Uh, but my books, my books on Christianity are non-denominational. So there's no doubt I'm a Catholic, but the books focus on the C.S. Lewis mere Christianity consensus. And one happy experience of promoting these books is that all the Christian denominations, we're all good friends now. And they all promoted the book. So naturally, I spoke at a lot of Catholic functions. But uh, in Protestant functions, they quite often have people speak in the religious service. So I've had the quite unusual experience for an Irish Catholic from the Western suburbs of speaking to giant Pentecostal religious services with hundreds and hundreds of worshippers in Melbourne and Perth, to Anglican uh, Sunday services, to Presbyterian services, I spoke last year at the Presbyterian annual dinner and began by describing how non-denominational I was, but I was very attached to the doctrine of purgatory because, you know, purgatory is the best chance 
for a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> you think of the helicopter leaving the embassy top uh, rooftop in Saigon, yes. and somebody grabs the last run of the rope ladder and just gets pulled up miraculously. That's the hope that a journalist has, you know. <laughs> maybe there's a recount, you know. Uh, <laughs> I said once to Tony Abbott, you know, we'll have a few million years to talk this over in purgatory. And he said, uh, said, you might be out in a few million, mate, but uh, I think it'll be a bit longer for me. And um, any event, the guy uh, at the end of the Presbyterian dinner stood up and said, well, here's a first for us. We've never been addressed by a Catholic before. And he made a joke about purgatory and we all laughed. And uh, the Presbyterians thought that was wonderfully uh, novel. Uh, I had these astonishing moments of grace on the ABC. You know, Richard Glover is a wonderful, wonderful broadcaster, uh, Sydney ABC afternoon broadcaster. He read the book so thoroughly. My only complaint about him was that his questions were so much more interesting than my answers. He said his wife was really worried that I might have had him because he started to doubt his atheism when he was reading about how the sheer statistical unlikelihood of the human experience, how unlikely it is that human beings would exist, that a planet sympathetic to them would be made and so forth. And um, uh, anyway, he did a wonderful interview about God is good for you. We spent a full half hour on it. And a lot of his listeners objected. A lot of the ABC listeners said, what is this Christian propaganda doing on the ABC, blah, blah, blah. And the next day, he scolded his listeners. He said, what a bunch of narrow-minded bigots you are, he said to them, <laughs> on the air, to his own listeners. Oh, and he was so kind, he said, this is a thrilling book. And he said, and if you think the ABC is pro-Christian propaganda, you must be crazy, you know. He said, this is the only Christian author I've ever interviewed, and you're so narrow-minded, you won't even listen. And I thought, wow, Richard Glover, he deserves a sort of Victoria Cross for kind of uh, <laughs> super courage. Another ABC experience I had, I was doing the conversation hour in Melbourne, there was a panel of people being interviewed, three of us, and um, the ABC interviewer was talking to me about the Pentecostals and she said, oh, those are the people who think the Holy Spirit or, or speaks through them in, in tongues, right? I said, yep, that's them. And she said, oh, I can't take them seriously at all. I said, oh, I don't know, I think you should take people's religious beliefs with some respect, even if you don't share them. She said, oh, I respect them, but I just can't take them seriously. It's all nonsense, isn't it? And one of my fellow panellists was a young Aboriginal woman, not as far as I know a Christian believer, I'm not sure really. I probably shouldn't say that about her. I just don't know anything about her religious outlook. But she, she was a musician, and she'd been engaged in the project of going around collecting the old mission songs from the Christian missions amongst Aborigines. And she said, oh, I don't know, she said to the... ABC presenter, you know, Greg might be onto something here. When we sing the old mission songs in remote Australia, we find there are more voices singing than there are people in the hall. Now, the ABC presenter was not going to contradict her. <laughs> <laughs> that was, all of a sudden, I had new credibility. <laughs> and what a generous... <clears throat> wonderful, lovely, young Aboriginal person to just, out of a spirit of generosity, come to the defence of Christians at that moment on the air. It's only a small moment, but it was um, a, a wonderful moment. I had a long-form discussion over Zoom with an atheist ethical giving podcast. So these are ethical atheists who engage in philanthropy, don't do it because of God, and they wanted to have a serious discussion about religious belief. And I thought, this is going to be very hostile and I better be defensive and play a straight bat and so forth and play a dead bat. Instead of which, it was the most open-minded, uh, you know, helpful, insightful, useful discussion. The questions were really interesting. They thought through these things much better than the new atheists had uh, in their lame books and so on. Fabulous uh, discussion. There's one time on a plane when I was researching the book and I was still a bit shy about being a public Christian. So I had all these other Christian books that I was using, and I'd put them on the, on the tray in a way that you couldn't see the title. And then I thought, well, that is really pathetic, isn't it? You know? <laughs> so, so then after that, I just let them so that, you know, I let them just fall naturally. So you could see the title if you wanted to. And getting off the plane, a woman approached me from across the corridor and said, 
excuse me, I can't help but be interested in all those books you've got about Christianity. And I said, yeah, thinking, okay, what's your beef? You know, what's, 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 what's your problem? Okay, put them up. And, uh, and she said, are you a priest? I said, no, 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 no. Not, that's the first time I've ever been mistaken in that way. <laughs> And it turned out she was a faithful member of the Salvation Army, but on, in that category of Salvation Army members who don't wear uniforms. And she was just so happy to have, uh, you know, a fellow Christian on the, on the flight, and that resulted in a moment of solidarity where she encouraged me and I encouraged her. And I think that's a reason that I, that I encourage all Christians to come out publicly, as it were, because fellow Christians can do with the encouragement and non-Christians in our pagan environment can do with any pointer the, to the truth uh, that they can get. Uh, speaking of Presbyterians, a, a Presbyterian in the employ of the Sydney Anglican Diocese, David Robertson, uh, did a series of podcasts on Christians in which he did a, a separate conversation with me about each chapter. And some of the chapters that he was interested in, he did two or three conversations. So he has, he has lots and lots of folks listen to his... Um, to his podcast, and there he was uh, talking uh, about the um, about the about the books. Then sometimes I was quite insistent about talking on the books. Uh, I, I address a number of business functions all the time. They always want to hear the same thing: What's China going to do? What's Trump going to do? And what can we do? <laughs> the answer is China will do whatever it likes. Trump is crazy and unpredictable, and you better. Um, Say your prayers. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but whenever the books are first published, I only will talk about the books. So there are a number of business functions where they said, we really want you to talk about China. And I said, no, I'll talk about God is good for you. And they said, oh, geez, I don't know. And I said, well, look, I'm too damn busy otherwise. So that's it. Take it or leave it. You got it. God is good for you or nothing. And so some of, them, some of them said, OK, well, we'll see you next year when you've returned to normal. And, <laughs> but some of them said, OK, we'll come and, talk to you about, come and talk to us about your book. So, you know, business audiences, which are not really sympathetic to Christianity anymore, there was a chance to, to talk to them uh, about the book. And as Carl mentioned, at, um, at least one student found their way to Campion through the book. Although one, one of the best functions for the book was one in Sydney, in Brisbane that I think was partly co-sponsored by Campion. And at the end of the talk, you know, there were some questions and a fellow got up in the audience and said, said, look, I found your book very bloody annoying. It's full of mistakes and your writing style is very annoying and I found the whole flaming book incredibly annoying and it's so annoying that I bought three copies and I'm going to send one to each person that I want to annoy. <laughs> And I thought, well, you can't, you're doing God's work. <laughs> you can't say fairer than that. And I thought, what a great new cover line. The perfect book for the person you want to annoy. <laughs> and, uh, so it was, it was enormous, uh, it was enormous fun, you know. Now, of course, the books are selling 30 odd thousand. That's fabulous. I'm so grateful for that. As I say, it's not Harry Potter territory. It's not a million books. It's not going to convert the culture by itself. And nor is that to disparage a book which sells 100 copies because one book read by one person might change a life. So you can't... Quantitative judgments don't really apply. And um, uh, I think anyone who writes in defence of Christianity or who produces podcasts or films or educates in defence of Christianity is doing fantastic work. And the moral of the story is something which, as Carl says, is a spiritual Irishman. I live my life by, and that is simply this. You can't win the lottery if you don't buy a ticket. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, because of the flight delays and that, Greg thought um, he should, uh, and I certainly agree very strongly, uh, provide an opportunity for any uh, signing of the two books before he leaves. Um, so what we might do is have um, a short period now of questions, comments, uh, and then we might have uh, maybe 
seven, ten minutes uh, before the next session begins, which Greg is staying to introduce, um, when I talk about Chester creating Campion College. So that's the slight variation over the next quarter of an hour or so. Uh, Greg needs to leave at four, so um, that, uh, that will all, all fit in. So, um, my question is, and thanks for that, Greg. Um, I read it goes good for you and loved it. Um, what's your prognosis on this robust atheism which we've got in the world today? The question, so the question is, what's the analysis of, or prognosis of the robust atheism we have today? Well, I think a couple of things. First of all, we know it's a very clear promise from Christ in the Gospel, the gates of hell. You, you are the church and the gates of hell will never prevail against you. Secondly, historically, it has been at times like this that the church has done its most brilliant rebounds. You know, I was interviewing Nikki, Nikki Gumbel, the Anglican progenitor of the Alpha programs, which we Catholics use quite a lot. And uh, he said to me, you know, in 1750, at St Paul's Cathedral in London, 16 or 17 people attended Easter services and there were 10,000 sex workers walking the streets of London. And you would have said Christianity was finished, kaput. Along came the Wesleys and the Wilberforces and uh, various others and Christianity just exploded all over the British Isles. And then you got the great renewals in the United States and so on. Now, we can't... That's not a licence for laziness on our part. We can't just say, OK, well, it's all going to get better magically. It only gets better if we... If we do something about it, I love that line of Wesley, you know, if you set yourself on fire with enthusiasm, men will come from miles to watch you burn. And, um, <laughs> but at the same time, you look out and you can see fabulous green shoots all over the place. I mean, there's nothing quite as wonderful as Campion College, but there are fabulous things everywhere. There's this great movement of Chesterton schools in the United States. Um, uh, every young priest you meet is on fire with orthodoxy and enthusiasm because Nobody goes into the priesthood today because it's a good career move or because that's what the school captain does or, you know, you play a lot of sport in the seminary or something. It is a really profound countercultural statement of deep belief um, if you do today. There are all these, what the church calls the new movements, you know, um, Focolare and, uh, you know, thousands of others. And um, a new church is being born. We are in statistical decline in the West, there's no doubt. Of course, religion is on fire everywhere else in the world. The one social force the Chinese Communist Party can't control is Chinese Christians. The church is exploding in expansion in Africa. Uh, religion is very dynamic in, in Latin America. And so everywhere except the West, the West, which is sort of in the very difficult moment at the moment, having great loss of faith in itself, is adopting this extremely eccentric course of atheism. Nowhere else is, you know. I've, one thing that made me confident to write about religion was spending my professional life in Asia because it's routine in Indonesia that somebody will say to you, well, excuse me, I've got to go and pray for 10 minutes because Muslims pray five times a day and so forth. It's normal in Thailand that anyone you meet has been to Buddhist ceremonies that day. In the Philippines, of course, uh, everyone's at church. Uh, all over Asia, religion is just routine. There's a form in the Indonesian government asks you, what religion are you? There is no religion. There is no form that says none. I interviewed Pope Tawadros, the Coptic Pope, and I, he had um, pretty good English, and I said to him, what, have you ever been tempted by atheism? And he said, what? And, and I, I <laughs> tried to explain it again. He said, I, just, I'm not, I don't quite understand your question. Could you <laughs> and I explained it to him again. And he looked at his friend, the local uh, <laughs> Egyptian Coptic uh, guy from Australia, who, and then they had an, ex an exchange, I don't know whether it was in Arabic or Coptic, but they had a deep exchange. And then Pope Tawadros understood the full nuttiness of my question. <laughs> and he looked at me for the first time with the unmistakable look in his eyes. They're really weird, these Australians, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and he just said, no, I've never, never been tempted. <laughs> so, you know, they're, they're doing well at the moment, but, I mean, they're full of crisis. I, I don't think, you know, we've got everything to play for. I mean, it's, this is a state of origin match. It's half time, they're ahead 18-0, but we're Queensland, you know. <laughs> <laughs> nice analogy. Sure. Uh, uh, 
Firstly, Greg, I'd like to just thank you for, uh, before I ask my question, I'd like to thank you for your article after the Voice referendum. Uh, it was a magnificent piece of writing. Um, I'm in a country town in regional New South Wales. Voted 70% uh, no, but um, it, was, it, it was reaffirming hugely how great our country is. Um, and I was so delighted that you, you, you wrote what you wrote. Um, but just getting on back to atheism, um, I don't so sure that atheism is such a pervasive thing. I think it's far better to talk about practical atheism. Okay, I mean, people don't actually deny the existence of God, but what they tend to do is they put a religion aside and are practical atheists. Okay, in practice, they would still uh, say they. Ha adopt Christian values, and, and, and many of people that we know, with, even in, within our families, have um, a um, what I, w I would describe a practical Christianity because they've absorbed it from childhood, okay? Um, and they know what's right and what's wrong, and they know about Christianity in a big in, in a big way. So I don't think we should get too carried away the with, uh, about about the volume of. Uh, you know, radical atheists. There might, there might be a lot in your profession, but not necessarily around the country. So, um, look, your question is very insightful. These terms are shorthand terms, obviously. Huge numbers of people are effectively agnostic. They say, well, I don't know. But they say, I don't know, in a way, which means they also they don't care. But there is a very, very large proportion of serious atheists. Yeah. So you, you've got to take people at face value. And 30% of the census says, I am an atheist. I don't believe in God. I believe there is no God. Well, if that's what they say, I, you know, I mean, we might sort of interpret it in some kind of complex subtextual way and say, but really they're still, uh, you know, spiritual seekers or something. But uh, they are atheists. And even the ones who adopt the pagan gods are atheists. Not all of them, of course, but a lot of them. So they'll say the earth. The Earth is is our mother. Gaia is a is a personality. Blah blah blah. But they don't mean that in any genuine metaphysical way. Um, they worship the principle of power, perhaps or money, but they don't mean that in any transcendent fashion. So in the West, we are developing very large numbers of real atheists. It is true that a lot of people live on the moral categories of Christianity, but you know what was Ernst Renan's. Um, line, you know, the burden of which is you, if you cut the thing off from its roots, eventually it'll die. We're, we're, li yeah, we're living on the perfume of an empty vase. And um, uh, so uh, I don't think that sustains us for very long. That's why we've got to, we've got to revive everything. Yeah, so there's three great books on it, uh, uh, Frank Brennan, Keith Winshuttle and Jared Henderson. And you're right, but the left never says sorry. So you saw it after the no debate, after the no vote. Nobody on the yes side said, hmm, gosh, maybe the proposition to create racial classifications within the Constitution <laughs> wasn't such a great idea after all. What they said was, you poor stupid fools, you're so uneducated, you fell for these lies and manipulations, you know. They had about a squillion dollars and the no case had, you know, the price of a kebab across the road. And <laughs> Simeon got me for lunch out of his vast generosity. And, and yet still they say, you know, the, the odds were stacked against us and all that. Nobody says sorry. But it's great providence, it's great mercy that the Cardinal didn't die while he was in prison because most people would believe he was guilty. Uh, he was absolutely vindicated by the High Court, absolutely vindicated. 
He produced those three wonderful uh, volumes of prison diaries, which have become kind of spiritual classics. And have already been read by a lot of non-Catholic Christians as, as great contemporary works of spiritual reflection. And he was fully alive. You know, he was back in Rome. He was as happy as a... Larry was getting ready for the next conclave. He was, you know, in mortal combat, uh, just where he liked to be. And uh, I mean, it's a tragedy that he died. I'm sorry that he died. But there's a, there's a kind of a fitness to it in a, in a way. So I think we can be we can be grateful for the mercy of it all. Uh, and of course, you know, it's right to celebrate the cardinal. He's one of the first people in a contemporary Western society to go to jail precisely because. He was an Orthodox Christian, and uh, I suspect he won't be the last, but everybody who defended him made it a little bit less likely that they'll do the same thing again. It would be a bit harder next time. Angel, we'll just make this last question. Yeah. Could you keep it short, please? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for what you've said. Um, I, I felt very identified with it. almost everything you've said. About a year ago, I started a podcast, and a few months ago, I started the social media and I get a lot of backlash, especially from our Christian brothers. And then there's where I wanted to, if you have some sort of advice, um, generally my wife tames me a lot when I want to send any, uh, something that is not very charitable. But yes, yeah, so how, how to, I find it very hard sometimes to find common ground at a charitable level that we can converse. And especially on the other side of the screen that sometimes make face to face always works, on the other side of the screen makes it harder. So anyways, you have some words in there. Yeah, so look, I don't have any solutions for you, but I just say the screen tends to, in, to encourage the worst in us all, and um, people who are generally quite civil will be really gravely uncivil on, on Twitter and so forth. Uh, I, I don't think it's good for Christians to be abusing each other on theological matters, and it's not a very effective method of argument anyway. Uh, Humour and good humour are much more effective. You know, Boris Johnson, he's fallen from grace now, and, and entirely his own fault, you know, he's very undisciplined and so on. But his rise was that he was just so unflappably good humoured about everything. You know, once, once some idiotic journalist at the BBC made some extravagant attack on him and he was going to get the sack, and Johnson intervened to save his job, and he said, well, you know, it's a bit strange, isn't it, if some lefty at the BBC can't make an unreasonable attack on a Tory minister, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> there was just so wonderfully good humoured, you know. And uh, I think um, some Catholics are a bit shameful in the way they talk about each other in religious controversy. I mean, it's meant to be a religion of love and so forth. Now, look, you know, in making these criticisms, I have no moral standing to make these criticisms at all. I do try to have two different personalities, though. My political personality where I'm dealing with China and Trump and everything and, uh, you know, I try not to attack people as human beings or as individuals in that context either. But I'm a bit more rough and, rough and tumble there. Mm -hmm. But if I'm in a religious discussion or a controversy about Christianity, I'm just not going to be that same person. And friends of mine read my book along the way before it was published. There was one line where I was talking about the early Christians and I said these these people weren't virtue signalling for a future ABC controversy. <laughs> and my friend, my friend sort of circled it and said, OK, so is this a culture wars book? Is that what it is? Is that really what you're wanting to do? Mm. And of course, you put in a phrase like that, you think, gosh, I've won that moment, isn't that brilliant? But actually, nobody who doesn't already agree with you is ever going to agree with you. So what are you writing for? You're writing for reinforcing the folks who already agree with you? Or are you trying to have a genuine discussion with, with folks who maybe don't necessarily agree with you. But having said all that, better to do something and make mistakes than to do nothing at all. Carl. Greg, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I think Greg has, has uh, picked a, a very um, crucial weakness in the culture, uh, highlighted through the, the, the great interest and continuing interest in what he's got to say, both in his books and newspaper articles and in the um, various other appearances that he makes as gratefully today. Um, I, it reminded me particularly his story about Richard Glover of, of Frank Muir, the English uh, scriptwriter, 
uh, comedy scriptwriter who uh, declared that on one occasion, near the end of his life, he was a lapsed agnostic. <laughs> he said that his doubts had begun to waver. <laughs> so I think, I think Greg has read that dimension of the culture, that feature of it, uh, very carefully and accurately. There's, there's a lot of doubts that are beginning to waver. So please join me in thanking Greg.